Okay, so today is October 24th, 2021, and we'll be continuing our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. Uh, we had an interesting discussion, but uh, do you want to start off with our contacts? So uh, with Derek Jensen planning to speak, uh, we might have a conversation with him sometime in November. Uh, it's been pretty busy, but um, hopefully we can talk to him again. And then uh, Max Wilbert sent me a, uh, a contact by a French a journalist um, or a film filmmaker. So I'll, I'll see if she wants to talk to us. She was interested in um, Max's project um, at Thacker Pass. Uh, they wanted to know about their perspective, American perspective on climate change and their different um, viewpoints. And so um, maybe we can be a part of that as well. So that's it for now. Yeah, okay, cool. Really nice. Yeah. Um, I haven't got a lot of stuff that I've managed to do this week. Um, as usual. Um, yeah, it's uh, the IB stuff and all of that, I'm, I just want to see where it's going, but I, I think I think that everything is now, you know, about COP next Sunday. Starts, uh, starts next week. And so I think everybody's kind of distracted by COP and stuff. So I, I don't know. I You see, uh, listening to those videos and stuff, it's, it's like... So I completely understand the track that they're on, but I, I I don't see it the same way. I think there's a fundamental difference, and I think that I think it's again you just kind of got to wait and see. You got to let them run out on the track that they're on, and uh, reap the fruits that they're going to reap, and then pick it up from there. But it's I kind of think that the stars are not aligned. They're not aligned for them, and they're not aligned for for us with them. So it's. Yeah, it's it's just I think a question of waiting. You see, the the way I see it, um, it, you know, tell me what you guys think. But I think that the that you know you've got to prepare. You've got to basically do preparation, all time preparation, preparation, preparation. Just girding your loins for the opportunity to strike, and then you know, and then strike. I think you can't force the issue and try and make make an opportunity when there isn't one. You just you just meet a wall of resistance. I think people are missing that. I think they're missing that in Thelma, the and you know Martin Luther King and taking all of that thing. They they're missing something that the it's it's ripe for that. So it's kind of you can't go off half cocked or when the situation is not right. So, so say so like the pandemic and stuff is is not it. It it is not the social or psychological tipping point. It's a it's a step in there, but it's like a softening up for for a bigger step. It is not the critical point of social change. So, in other words, to go now and say from a standing start that you're going to have global change in six months is like it. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe. Maybe it does all snowball, and it, I'm not reading it right. And it's you know everybody's ripe for revolution, but I, that's not my read. I think basically everybody's um, everybody's simmering, but they're not on the gas mark for you know for complete um, blowing the lid off the pressure cooker, which is where it has to be. So you, you I think you've got to bide your time and wait for the pressure to build up, but it's not at the explosive pressure point. So you, you see, I, my view is that you you don't have a lot of influence if you're thinking in terms of a rebellion or a revolution. You have to take your opportunity. You've got to sow seeds. You've got to build up the pressure. But you know, it's uh, it's frustrating because you know we're on a fixed timeline. But uh, you you have to accept that maybe the stars don't align. Maybe people will not get to a right point where you can lance the boil and make a you know 
the, it's it's a lancing the boils a good analogy. See what the I think what doctors used to do in the old days was they didn't lance a boil too early. They'd wait for it to build up and build up and build ahead. When it was absolutely ripe, they would get out the lancet and then go and lance it when it was ready. And it's kind of like you make a more of a a problem by lancing the boil too early. So and so I don't think that the world has come to a boil. It's simmering. It's simmering all right, but I don't think the pandemic is the boil over point. So I don't see world revolution in the next six months. So that what do you guys think about this? <laughs> I, I didn't listen. I didn't have time to listen to the whole um, video of uh, Roger about the six months. So I, I can't answer to, to exactly. I don't know what he's saying, really, uh, but I can. I gather from what you're saying that I mean, and what I the little bit I know, and that I read uh, that we are not, we are not there yet. And I, I, I'm sometimes surprised to see people going off this huge militant attitude of rebellion with the situation with the COVID because that's energy that is wasted at the moment, and and rebellion that should be better channeled uh, in other areas and at a later date. Because I, I mean. You know, you don't want to waste your time at the moment with this uh, vax, anti-vax, and stories about the vaccine and stuff. It's it's you're going yeah, down. Yeah, it's, it's 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 valuable way. because it's it's raising the pressure. Yeah, it's see, it's raising the pressure on society. So it's all rather good, and you should you know help stoke the flames. But it's not the critical point. So you see, I, I think where they're coming from is like, well, we're under the gun. There's an agenda. We have no time to waste. So we, we have to act now. And I say like, well, we have to act now is logical, but it, it might not be practical. You have to, you might have to say, look, if the time to act is now, and if we don't act now, it's too late. But if we're powerless to act now, we have to accept that that's it. We, we're going to fuck up. You know, we, we're not going to live. You know, it's again, it's not, it's not guaranteed that we win, <laughs> guys. <laughs> so it doesn't matter that it says, like, we have to act now. We've got six months. We have to do something in the next four years and stuff. It's like, yeah, but maybe the stars just don't align that way. Maybe the world just doesn't see it that way. And is, you're not going to have a revolution by you, you can't force a revolution with 10 people going and being martyrs. You, you see, it's like, look at the Arab Spring. It's like the Arab Spring was not caused by that vegetable seller guy who self immolated in front of the Tunisian parliament. Whereas that was the final straw that built up. You can't say the guy went and self-immolated in Tunisia and that led to the Arab Spring. Therefore, I want the Arab Spring. I'm going down to the police station to self-immolate. He's like, no, that's a very poor reading of the situation. That 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 guy was the spark that lit the frame because the whole room was at the flashpoint. And then he was the spark that lit. But you can't go like striking your light in the room when, when the room's not at the flashpoint. So... You're striking a spark in like damp wood, you know. It's just the way the way I see it. I'm not. I, my my gut feel is we, this: the wood is too damp. People don't see it. People people are not seeing that we how bad climate change is and stuff. The next thing that likely to happen is we're going to come out of COP26, and it's going to be very lukewarm and more bullshit and empty promises and look like Paris where everybody talks and talks crap and slaps each other on the back and nothing happens. And so everybody's, it's just, you know, add that a couple of more millibars to the pressure. But it's not like Rupert Reed and stuff says, it's like, oh, people are going to come out of cop and people are going to be really angry that there's no action and stuff. It's like, it's not going to be like that. They're going to promise action. <coughs> Nobody's going to be angry after cop as far as I can tell. People are going to come out of cop frustrated. Because there, there won't be anything definitive. They'll make huge lies and promises. Everybody will know that they're bullshit. But nobody will be so sure that it's bullshit that they will go and then start the revolution. So it means we've got to keep on. 
building the egregore, finding like-minded people, building, uh, you know, I think an underground network, spreading, you know, being the cancer's cancer. So I think we just got to keep on eating away, being the cancer's cancer, just doing, doing what we're doing. It's like, but, but my my view. <laughs> Would somebody like to do something else? Should we all be going and throwing ourselves in the square with a dramatic gesture or something? What, what did other people no, think? No, I think we have, to, we have to endure and we have to continue with, as what we're doing. I don't really know. I, I absolutely think that the situation is not right for this sort of thing. For, we, have to, we have just, sometimes it's, it's um, difficult. But it's not, it's the only way. Yeah, I, I agree yeah. with um, Sophie there. And um, that's why um, I was focusing more on the self-development series. Uh, and that's why I had that earlier talk with you, Hugh, because I think that, I think a better use of that time would be personal self-development because eventually there will be time for action. But I think self-development is a, it's a good thing to, to um, review time and time again. Yeah, yeah. It's so that, that's the way I see it. It's it's long, long time of preparation, and then decisive action. But the but the they are they going to decisive action without preparation? It's like you say. Well, they might argue. Well, we've had thirty years of preparation with all the sciences there. You know, this is cutting edge social science and stuff. And it's like. Nah, it's all bullshit that hasn't worked in 30 years. Get real. So it is one thing that the past 30 years of activism, activism has said is you need new tactics. Get the... This is not MLK. This is not Gandhi. Move on. Move the fuck on. We've been trying the same broken fucking record. We've been stuck in this rut. We have to ch change tactics. And you, you see, they... I, I'm having a little rant here, but you see, they're doing this in a vacuum. They assume that, that A, that we're not heading into all these crises. They're not looking ahead to the environment that we're going to have to act in. And so it's it's not in 2019. It's not happy time where you go and do your, your little you know, green activism. This is serious shit time. You know, tell me how green activism works when we go to war with fucking China. Tell me how it works when we've got fucking famines and, you know, if there's a die-off in India for, for a wet bulb event. Tell me how it all works then. Show me the grid go down and then tell me what your tactic is. But you see, they just doing none, no planning for that. It's as if we just, you know, it's just us. It's very solipsistic. It's very closed-minded. And it, it's, it's like, how's this going to work, man? You've got to anticipate where we're going. And look, you know, it's it's pretty easy to see see where where we're going. This is going to be a financial collapse. People people are missing that they they, they we, in effect we are having a slow burn general strike around the world. This is a fabulous opportunity to explore. What are you doing? Sitting in a fucking road? What's fucking wrong with you, man? If you got to say like, okay, where are we at? We're not in fucking Selma. We're fucking in the middle of a pandemic, two years into a pandemic, where there were just the, the, the fucking supply chain shocks and, and logistical problems, which I said in February 2020 when I wrote this thing about what's going to happen in the pandemic. And I said, it's going to be very difficult to get, once you stop all of these things and have lockdowns, they're going to be supply chain shocks. They're basically it's a well-known thing. In, in economics, that you can destroy companies by just having a, 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 it's called a supply chain shock. You just have a hiccup in the supply chain and it fucks everything up, make companies go bust. And they happen for no reason. So this is obviously one that's happening. So it's a fantastic time to exploit. Why, why you had a, a two years to prepare. What do you do? Sit at home in lockdown saying, well, we can't act now because there's a pandemic. It's like, what? This is an opportunity of a lifetime. But anyway, having my little rant here, but the, 
you see you see what I mean is the the different way of operating is try and anticipate what world events coming and say what what are we gonna do for the financial collapse that's imminent you say like we're about to go through hyperstagflation like what's your plan for that sit in a road <laughs> no <laughs> what's sitting in a road gonna do for fucking Wall Street what are you gonna do when the fucking cyber attack comes in you know, it's like it's like all these opportunities whoosh, 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 going past why because you got fixed idea you do a fix a we'll do them okay <laughs> oh boy you have you have put something that I I liked and I understand very well is the white lotus um, secret society Chinese secret society because that is not a waste of time like preparing secret societies building underground um, networks I hate the word but you know that sort of thing um, that is and I really liked that uh, ethos because they have no dogma they just practical uh, but at the same time they're a great base for uprising by what I see in history would you do you know a bit more about this Yeah, I, I don't know much about them, but I mean, as soon as I, I, I haven't read like a book on them or anything like that. But but as soon as I, uh, I mean, I knew about them from the Boxer Rebellion and peripherally and stuff, but I haven't really studied them. But as soon as I saw about them, and I thought, yeah, this is this is this this is the formula. But it's it's the same. It's a it is a standard for. Um, rebellion technique is most most rebellions had a secret society behind them like the french revolution and stuff is is like you have to be a historian to just say oh it was all these huge class struggle and stuff there's no man the freemasons were fucking up to their elbows in it the, the same in the american war of independence they had all these secret societies and stuff putting their ore in now, historians don't tell you about them because it, it wasn't written in the fucking sunday times but behind the scenes, that that's what's happening. That's all these these players, you know. They're 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 a whole lot of these things right now. And there's anonymous and a whole load of cyber hackers and lone wolf groups and you know a lot more than GDR and stuff, right? But uh, you know that is uh, they they the armies of these little networks and stuff. So it's, it's like you know. We all work together doing our own little thing. It's it's not necessary to say, oh, we need two thousand people. It's like seven is fine. That's you know, the Communist Party at the point of the you know World War One and stuff, it was about seven people. It's like that's it it's that you see, the the people that are like minded, that are working in different domains towards the same goal. So, so you have to think. So it's not about a you know, they say, oh, a movement of movements and stuff. And say, no, what they're thinking of is you know, you have the same crap left wing tactics we do. So we see eye to eye. And you say, no, it's it's guys on the right wing. It's guys that have you know, religion, Christian types, and stuff that you fundamentally don't agree with. But we are aligned. We can all see that this fucking e tyranny is coming down the pipeline we want to don't don't look too closely it's like, like oh you know you're a fascist so we're not we can't talk to you so why the fuck not like i i don't care who he is as long as he stands up against eternity Anyway, you can see the theme that, that my thinking is is that is that we we are freaking doomed. We're we're in the Titanic. There's not much time left, so we kind of have to do um, accelerated enlightenment. It, it doesn't it doesn't work to you know transform the world and still you know have the mentality of a prisoner. So you can't. You can't say, okay, we, we're going to transform the prison when all the guys still have the mindset of a prisoner. You can't, can't do it. So you have to do both. You have to 
work on the prisoner, <laughs> get them to change their mindset, and then work at the same time in tandem, work against the prison. And then hope that they all come come to align so we can have a prison break. You know, it's, it's like saying, guys, we're going to sit in the road and everybody's going to join us and then we're going to have a prison break. Uh, I can see a few other outcomes. One, you get fucking steam out of it. Police crimes bill, guys. Police crimes bill. You might ignore it, but it's not going to ignore you. They have <laughs> we're bad. Yeah, um, oh dear. I just wanted to say that um, the valuable thing that I'm trying to work on is what you had mentioned about withdrawing support for the system. Um, so that's something I'm working on. And um, for my little corner of the world, what I see is that a lot of my, well, the people I know, they are still hoping like you said, to go back to 2019, to become normal, to become normal again. And um, I think a lot of people, that's, that's what they're hoping for. Um, and they're not seeing the background of um, all the environmental problems and the systemic problems that are facing us. So, yeah, that that that's where I'm. That's all I have to say for now. Yeah, I don't. I don't think uh, normal is gonna come back. I mean, nine uh, eleven was uh, over twenty years ago, and we still have to take our shoes off at airports and stuff. These things don't ratchet backwards. They only ratchet forwards when we when we cede power to to authority. I I also think that there's gonna. The way I see it, there's going to be crisis after crisis. So there's wave after wave after wave. People are going to be like desperate to catch a breath. They're going to be like, fuck, will, it, will these things ever stop? And the answer is nope. See, the way, the way I think 2020 is a very, very crucial year. And the way to see it is, is a, it is a tipping point, although it's kind of overused expression. The way you must think of it like an aircraft with, uh, it's uh, wing foil and it's it's like boundary separation. So up until 2020, we've got laminar flow. And uh, after 2020, we get uh, flow separation, what they're called. It's got turbulence in a store. What, what normally happens to an aircraft now is it goes into an incipient spin. And I think that's what we're doing. So, yeah. The guys, the guys don't have the knowledge to pull the, the Earth system out of an incipient spin. And so that's that's where we're headed. So it's like, hold on to <laughs> hold on to your fucking hat. <laughs> this is gonna be rough. Yeah. You see so you can see the things stacking up. You can see them stacking up. Yeah, the the more I, I see the the more I wonder if it's even worth uh putting efforts into you know the prison yard and trying to fix it or if we should just be putting our efforts into uh when it collapses around us how are we going to deal with that like what what is our future after that um because i i a lot of times these things do um you know they'll they'll implode on their own um or and the process of trying to get them to implode makes you a target. Yeah, no, so... Yeah, you think you should work very, very hard not to be a target. So that's one of the things that's wrong with this you know, kind of MLK strategy is like the, the nail stands too proud. And in, in you know, that, that Gandhi kind of thing was like, we, we, we're we up in more a more situation like against Hitler rather than civil rights. So, so, you know, Hitler said to Lord Halifax, he said, why don't you just fucking shoot Gandhi? And Halifax had to try and explain to Hitler, like, well, we're English, we don't do that kind of thing. And Hitler was like, well, you're going to get fucked up, aren't you? <laughs> so it's much more like the Hitler situation where, you know, it's like you, 
you know, you stand too proud in this, the guys are going to hammer you badly. So I'd say, you know, it's got to, you've got to resist. But now my thinking is that you have to resist for your own soul. What I found in, in South Africa is uh, everybody knew that apartheid was going to, going to end. You know, that some would admit it, some would not, but everybody knew somewhere deep down that this is completely unsustainable. It's just some people would say, not in my lifetime, and some people like me would say, 10 years, baby, <laughs> 10 years, the show's over. And, and then, uh, so the, the main thing, uh, though, is that what I noticed was if you you don't resist. In other words, you say, like, oh, this is over in 10 years. Why should we even lift a finger? It's like the, the, it eats your soul to do that, to, to sit by and, and watch is that it's, it's this, <laughs> this is something, some fundamental law or something in the universe you're kind of violating. But it, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to say it, but you kind of, losing your self-respect or um, you're doing something unnatural. It's a, uh, that Maybe that's the way to describe it. It's unnatural to sit and watch uh, things slide. So, so you don't want to go nuts and start flailing. And you, you also don't want to go, well, we'll just see how this pans out. I don't know. Maybe it's a personal thing. Maybe, maybe there are guys out there that can can go like, yeah, yeah, I can watch this ship with a beer. But you see, what, what scares me is the, those guys who say, I'm going to just sit back and watch this with a beer, is like, you're not going to watch this on television. What You're in denial. You see, what, these guys are thinking that they kind of excluded from this. And you're saying like, oh, I'm just going to watch this. It's, okay, that's fine. As long as watching this means you, you're being ass raped from the back. Okay. And you're just sitting around watching this, okay? And you're saying like, "Ooh, I would thought you were, you know watching it meant watch it on TV with a beer in mind." No, it's being ass raped and watching it. So it's like, you know, think like, think of it more like that. It's more visceral. It's like you're about to be ass raped. Do you fight or do you just say, "Ah, oh, well, he'll do his thing and then I'll he'll let me go." It's like, <laughs> well, how do you live as a rape victim after that? Maybe if you fought back, you might basically get less trauma out of the rape. Think of it more like that. A bit harsh, but I have to use that analogy because people <laughs> tend to get a bit too left brain and it's an academic exercise like, oh, I'm going to read this in the newspaper. Yeah, this is a wow, this stuff is uh, epidemic. But I just saw this um, Sabine Hossenfeld, the, the physicist woman, um, and she's interviewing this. Uh, climate scientist and he he just examined the same conceit of of the liberal classes and they're like so convinced that like this is a thing that they're going to be millions of people you know that, that are you know being displaced they're going to be mass uh, movements and stuff like that and it's it's or got this tone of like oh the brown people are going to suffer it's like listen dude Get over that shit. The brown people are not going to suffer. You live in London. Like, you have a long way to fall to equilibrium. If I live in a fucking grass hat in Gambia, I don't have much for it. If, like, when, when the EMP, H-A-E-M-P, goes off over fucking America, if I'm in Kenya growing fucking coffee, it's like, not going to be a fucking skin on my nose. Nothing's going to happen to me. If I'm in a sky rise in New York, I'm in deep trouble. If I'm in a wheelchair in a sky rise in New York after that H-A-M-P and the, the grid down, I'm in fucking dire trouble. But all these guys are like, oh, but I'm rich and privileged and I live in New York with a high income. So this is, you know, it's going to be devastating for all these poor brown people. <laughs> no, <laughs> you've got further to fall. It's like looking down from the top of a Jenga tower and saying, ooh, those poor brown people at the bottom of this Jenga tower, they've got a long way to fall. It's like, look at yourself. You're at the fucking top of the Jenga tower. Yeah, yeah, they've I, got I, a forest. I, they can go and get bush meat. You go and show me how you get fucking bush meat out of Central Park. Man, these guys are arrogant. 
What I'm trying to say is you're not going to glide over it. That makes me think. So this is a city is. people problem. The guys in the crosses are in the fucking city. Right? Get that through your skull. It's like I'm trying to stop people. I'm trying to help people not get traumatized. This, the way I see it is I'm a re expressing my South African trauma, but I'm reading my radar saying we're in South Africa. I'm back in the youth that I thought I'd never see again. I'm saying, I'm trying to tell you, trauma, guys, you are going to suffer trauma. Okay. Now, here's Hugh's gift to you is first, get that through your head. You're about to be fucking ass raped. Try and think of the worst thing that you can imagine happening to you. It's going to happen. <laughs> That's what's coming. Okay. You, so once you've got that in your head, when it comes, it's, it'll be a hell of a lot better. Right? So try and try and, if anything, try to think of it much worse than it's going to be. If I get this right, was when this bad shit worse than <laughs> bad, as, as uh, Roger Hallam says, comes down the pike and gets you, what goes around comes around. See, this is what happened in South Africa is people are denial, denial, <laughs> people popping around, you know. This neighbor is killed. This neighbor is raped. This, the, you know, and, and they all going like, it won't happen to me because I've got a gun. And then it happens to them. And then they freaking traumatize. Why? Because they didn't prepare psychology. The first thing is they didn't admit that, you know, it can happen to anybody. And it does. And the other thing they didn't admit is what goes around comes around. So, so when things get tough, these things are going to visit you. If you're looking for migrants and <laughs> mass caravans, you're it. <laughs> Don't just because the the first guys to get going are now in South America and the caravans are <laughs> coming up from Somalia. It's like, <laughs> those guys are just the first front runners. You're in the middle of the pack if you live in New York or somewhere. <laughs> Beijing. Or so I'm I'm trying to prevent you suffering trauma because if you suffer too much trauma, you won't. Survive. I want people to survive. Yeah, but so, we, so one of the want... things that'll take you down is trauma, and so so you 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 know you can't think in terms of um, I'm I'm going to escape this. I'm going I'm going to glide over it. I'm going to prep my way out of it. You're not. It's it's going to hit you square between the eyes. That's the first step to to accept that. But what what A was saying at the start as as a form of of attitude that we could have at the moment. Which is stepping out as much as possible and trying to, you know, be. And what Ryan was saying too about our attitude, um, should we bother at all? Do you know that sort of, well, I, I know you don't mean that, Ryan, but, uh, and Hugh answered, well, you know, our soul, I mean, I think our soul would suffer too myself if, if you didn't stand up to, to what you see. And it's a, it's a, it's a matter of, of, you know, well being nearly to, and and to to follow this this natural instinct to to rebel, but um, I, I I still think that um, I still think like Mike that the the personal preparation, knowing yourself and and developing your 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 psychological muscle, if I may say, is 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 extremely important. We we really need to we really need to go to 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 to, to concentrate on that and. And that will be a way of not only healing all trauma, but preventing the next traumas to 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 be a bit to be born a little bit easier. And uh, yeah, and uh, we, we that, that's what I think anyway. No, absolutely, absolutely. So the point I'm I'm trying to make is that people that do well in in trauma of or philosophical, or people that go through an ordeal of, of philosophical about it. Um, so, you know, if you if you go into it in flat out denial, oh man, it's going to hit you hard. The stuff stuff that's coming is bad. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. Feel bad. And I mean, it's like when it's like I don't know, like five years, ten years, but soon, much sooner than everybody thinks. There's basically, see, what concerns me is. Is, is people are going to be blindsided, and that's that's half half the the pain and misery is from the blindsiding, even more than the actual actual events that we're about to see. 
Yeah, I, I saw something earlier today about kind of the five phases of realization about uh, doomerism, I guess. Um, one was, uh, phase one was thinking that everything's fine, um, and that's the one you're most afraid people are going to be stuck at. Um, and yeah, I think having that opinion is pretty much fatal. Um, uh, and then the second is you, you find one problem, like global warming or, you know, e-tyranny or, you know, one of these things, and then you, you get kind of uh, hyper aware about that and you start being railing against that one thing and you get really inspired to like join some uh you know march somewhere or something like that and you, um and then you, you the phase three is uh you realize there are multiple problems right that it's it's not just that uh global warming is the issue it's that you know you have collapse in this this area you have you know disease vectors in that area you have uh, you know uh insecurity cyber attacks and you have you have um you know the the destruction of topsoil and all these things uh uh you, you realize there are multiple problems and then phase four mean uh, is when you realize that there are interaction effects between these problems and that's when it starts to be oh wow so uh, you can't solve one of these without causing problems in the others to get worse, right? And uh, the the interaction effects may, means that you you just start to to realize that you know, maybe this action these actions like this march or this uh, you know activism stuff is is actually counterproductive. Like maybe I should step back. Maybe I should think about what I'm doing. Um, and uh, it might be that these problems you know to prevent extinction it's just intractable and um th that there may not be a solution right and then uh step five is where you you kind of uh you know you see all this and uh it starts to you, know, you become like a, a solid doomer that um realizes there isn't a way out and then it's you know, where do you go from there? It's a very depressing place. And I think what you're saying, Hugh, is that um, your psycho your psychology, like it's a lot better to feel like you're Batman in a secret society or something and you're 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 kind of um, you know pushing against the the evil rather than just being, you know, the um the t just taking the brunt of the the psychological trauma um head on with without any kind of mental preparation and i think that's that's kind of what the my first comment was about i wasn't saying we're going to watch this on tv by the way uh tool there's a tool video vicarious about this very thing um uh it's a a band um that maybe you won't like but it's uh it's uh it's about watching extinction from a distance on tv and thinking that that that's that's enough um uh yeah it it's a pretty intense video um can, then, can, you, uh, can you send a link to that video please uh sure sure thank um, you uh and uh but but ultimately i i was talking more about um the the interaction effects thing so if if you you know, make a name for yourself trying to solve one problem, uh, you become a target for another problem. If you uh, try to, you know, solve global warming by, you know, Green New Deal, you cause the very problem you're trying to solve. Um, they're, they're, and these these are the kinds of questions that I'm um, I'm considering. Like a lot of the things that a lot of my enemies have ended up ended up just, you know falling apart because other people didn't like them either right and they, they would get fired or these kind of things like it was um and had i been really actively fighting against them i might have made the situation worse for myself and and so i'm it's uh, yes yes it's not about not taking preparation or not taking action it's about um uh not uh 
taking uh you know default actions from panic right it's about making selective actions yeah. okay. that um that where where you need to be very careful about which which actions you take and so i was saying why don't we focus on the actions post collapse where if we're so sure that that collapse is happening like is there um uh do you have what you need mentally to bring into that new situation um and i yeah. granted there's a there's a phase between now and then that you have to survive um so both both need preparation one more urgently than the other of course because you may not even survive it um uh to to see the other side so yeah see the way i see it is that five stages of doomerism is kind of like a birthing process where doomerism you want to get to quickly that's kind of postpartum so you you want the birth to be quick and you want to get to doom or postpartum so so doomers are in a good place because they they might be depressed as as hell but if they lose all their hopium, it's uh, the same as basically being birthed. They just got to like cut the umbilical. They got to do a little bit more work. <laughs> but but in essence, they are out of the womb uh, when they do it. See, the danger is is that uh, we're going to be stillborn as a society because it's like you say that the, the danger in in the denial, collapse denial. People like Michael E. Mann. They're saying, like, you know, we still have human agency. That's completely the wrong message because it's delaying the birth. It's basically you want, want to get people to doomerism, not get them past this hopium state. And so the reason for it is they, they go, I keep on trying to warn people that there's terrible, terrible danger in, in this critical, that, that fourth stage where people realize that it's an intractable problem. You see, in proving to themselves it's checkmate, they'll cause incalculable damage. You see, the obvious ones are like geoengineering. So, so it we're in checkmate, but you know you want to basically throw this game as as soon as possible. And see, if they start doing things like geoengineering, it will mean that we're underlying any chance. Uh, we we're just throwing away any chance that that we can live beyond this chess game. <laughs> so we. You know, we have no reason to hope when people start doing crazy shit. And they're going to do crazy shit. So, you see, geoengineering is never going to work because it would just take too damn long. And we, we passed the, the tipping points. And so, so, I mean, sorry to say tipping points because this is such a damn thing. But let me just say one thing about, like, tipping points that people don't realize. I think they think that when we passed a tipping point, you're going to get a news headline in The Guardian saying, well, guys, we just passed the final milestone, point of no return on the Arctic ice or the Amazon and stuff. It's like, no, you're not going to get anything in the mail <laughs> that tells you. You're not going to get a memo. There's not going to be any announcement on the tannoy the pilot's gonna not gonna come on and say oh, ladies and gentlemen i just want you to know that we have just passed a major tipping point from here on out we had a point of no return and we were sure to ditch in the ocean please prepare you're not gonna get that announcement let me tell you what, what what it's like it's it's like okay take this analogy if you're in a canoe if you puck a hunter in a canoe and you're going downstream well, it's all like very nice paddling. And as you paddle, you, you carry on. Now you can hear the fucking rapids ahead. You can hear this, maybe a waterfall. It's not sounding good. And you can feel the current is starting to move faster and faster towards the thing. So you know, this is not looking good. This is the situation. Where's the tipping point? Well, it's not that it's not announced in any big way. The tipping point for Pocahontas is is when uh, essentially when she can see the transits on the shore are moving twice as fast as she can paddle. So let, let me just think about that. See, pa Pocahontas is at the point of no return when if she's paddling along happily, which is what we're doing, we're pumping out CO2 and greenhouse gases and doing 
waste of time shit like COP and stuff and activism, we, we're still paddling in the same direction, which is basically GDP growth and industrialism and carrying on and working this machine, which is an analogy for paddling, right? So now, so the point of no return is when, if Puck just turns around, the current is already moving faster than she can paddle. So she only knows that when she's looking at the shore and she's saying that basically, you know, the shoreline and transits on the shoreline are moving twice as fast as, uh, uh, as she can paddle. In other words, if she turns around, she can't row against the current. Now, if you look at the situation that way, we passed. <laughs> you see, if, if we turned around now and we did... Sam Mitchell did a, a very good video on this, which kind of highlighted in a very nice Zoomer way. Was a, the, a guy, one of Sam's friends, wrote in and said, you know, this is where we're at in terms of carbon capture. If you got every single uh, power station, every single greenhouse gas emitting whatever, smokestack and chip and everything like that and you basically just flip the sign in other words you say whatever they're putting out in carbon now they suddenly miraculously flipped and became carbon capture machines at the same rate they're putting out now say so how long would it take to get back to 350 basically in other words safety to get back to calm waters where we can paddle the answer is 30 years <laughs> so ask yourself so you say, well, how can that be? Because, you know, it didn't take 30 years to get here, but you've got to work out that basically there's, there are more sources of greenhouse gas than just the smokestacks. But anyway, if the, it gives you an idea of how deluded we are in this fourth stage of denial. Because people, you know, the IPCC and respected people that have won Nobel Prizes and that are in essence saying all we have to do, all Pocahontas has to do is to slow down. Just, we just have to paddle faster and find, you know, may, maybe attach an outboard motor that, you know, keeps us stationary and pay face in the other direction. It's like, no, you've got to get back to 350 parts per million. And we, we're past this kind of event horizon where <laughs> if you started, you know, we're not even, we don't even have the technology for carbon capture yet. We can't get there from it. You can't plant trees in lines. You can't plant a million trees. You're just planting firewood. Again, you'd be adding to the problem. See, planting trees in like pines and lines kind of forestry way <laughs> is wrong kind of geoengineering. It's geoengineering. And you say, oh, but it's planting trees. Isn't that good? No. You're planting firewood. They're basically, you need forest. The forest is an ecosystem. The, it takes decades and decades, maybe 50 years to make a forest. You need forests, not pines and lines. Not fucking, you know, this guy saying, oh, we can plant seeds. We can have drones. And these guys are talking about, oh, they just shoot seeds into the ground and we can plant a trillion trees. Great. You've planted the worst fire break you've ever seen in your life. Uh, that's going up in fucking smoke before the trees are basically waist high. We, we're going into droughts, dudes. Those trees are going to, that's firewood you plant. <laughs> but these guys are going to have to learn because, A, think of the lessons they have to learn. They have to stop believing these experts. These experts are crazy. Stop believing billionaires. They're psychopaths. See, it's like, what are you saying, Hugh? I'm saying everything you believe is wrong. <laughs> Flip this yeah. whole world. Your yeah, whole got... worldview is wrong. And you have to do this rapidly in the next five years. Is it going to happen? Of course not. <laughs> yeah, we've got climate denial but on we the have right. Hope and we've got... If enough people realize that and get to tourism. Yeah, we've got climate denial on the right. And, uh, you know, this Green New Dealism, uh, uh, you know, false hope on the, on the left. And, like, the in order for everybody to abandon their little camp of left or right to, to get towards something that's more realistic, that's not going to happen. People are so tribal that they're not just going to like flip everything. If people will eventually all become doomers, but not via not, not a day sooner than they have to. Yeah. You, you see what people are, 
this is a very, very special circumstance. You see, what, that tribalism is actually good. It's in, in the normal course of what we evolved to do, that tribalism is good. You see a lot of this stuff where people are um, wailing about, you know, disinformation and social media and how these guys are, you know, are doing suppression and how these guys are, you know, have, having highly active users um, spreading disinformation and, and that is as if there's something wrong. So, no, this is right. It's exactly how we're supposed to work. How the, all these outrages happening on social media is correct. If you go and have a look at a beehive and see how they do consensus decision making, it's, it's you're doing it exactly like a beehive. When bees come and do a waggle dance and communicate where the best direction to the next hive is and stuff like that, there are crazy right wing Hitler bees that come and say, I have the best, I know, I know, this is the best hive, and it's the worst fucking hive. If they went there, they'd all die. So the bees have this way of basically getting to this consensus, and we're doing it. If you look at the analysis these guys do online of the social media, and they're like, oh, the horror, the horror. I say, no, not the horror. Go look at a fucking beehive. This is working correctly, right? All the battle between the left and the right. <laughs> it's supposed to work like that. Here's the problem. We in territory that you're not supposed to get to. The alien cortex has taken us into a trap where we have to get over ourselves. We have to be extremely unnatural. So, so behaving naturally is what we're doing. We're not broken. Everybody thinks we're broken. And if we, we, we can get fixed by getting consensus. No. If you've got consensus, you would be broken. Right? That is not the way the um, you know decision making happens or or you get uh, emergent decision making <laughs> so it, it happens by these biases and counter biases and that and all this stuff that we just do not have time for so you say well you, how unnatural do you have to be well you you've got to do an incredible feat of self knowledge you have to say like okay first of all you have to admit some really dark things one of them is we're going to get Thanos. We have to get Thanos. So is, guys, the 8 billion people, the 220,000 people net are added every single day. <laughs> it's like, I don't care what your opinion is on overpopulation or some wet dream of some economist, how you know, prosperity or AI is going to make prosperity. <laughs> like, dude, you're fucking nuts. This, this, we're, gonna, we're heading rapidly for overshoot, 10, 10 billion people, maybe 11, and then draw down. <laughs> it's just maths, dude. It's just got to get over it. We don't have the fresh water for your wet cream. Whether it's panels in the Sahara, and it's like everybody's like got their wet dream, but it's like they, they don't account for somebody else's wet dream needs the water that you have for this wet dream. It's like a, it's a complete wicked, super wicked problem. So so the the thing is, though, uh, we have to say we're in this kind of uh, predicament with kind of climbers. So, you know, like climbers hanging, uh, cliff hanging, and they're, you know, like they're all chained together on a, on a rope and like three or four of them have <laughs> dropped off, off the cliff. They're like two hanging onto the cliff. And you say like, you've got to cut that rope, man. <laughs> it's like you've got to cut that rope. Now we can't do that. Because he's saying, no, the mammalian brain goes nuts. Say, oh, what about the babies? What are the children? Ah, we can't deindustrialize. People are going to die. And then say, like, yes. And what's going to happen if we don't cut the rope? We're all going to die. So it's like it's one of those parachute dilemmas. Right? So, so there's research in saying that people are, are primed for extinction. Because if you do the research, if you, if you say to people, like, okay, which is worse? Uh, say, six billion people dying or human extinction? <laughs> Ironically, people will say, oh, six billion people dying. <laughs> it's like, how can that be? Surely it's worse that everybody goes extinct. That's exactly the point that you were making earlier. That That's exactly the point that you were making earlier. Because the natural reaction would be to say, that it's better to have six billion people die than to have human extinction. That's the natural. 
reaction. And you were you were mentioning also how the the liberal mind or the politically correct people go against this kind of of uh, carrying on on social media of people getting at each other, making a lot of noise, and that again, as you said, is a natural is, is a natural reaction of humans. And and to see the reaction of of the the media, the liberal people saying, oh. It's toxic. People should not be fighting like that. People should not be insulting each other. People should not be, you know, it's, it's again, again, against nature, against nature all the time. Every time you look okay, at but any we, we, but you, I hope, I hope we got this right. Is what I was saying was we have to go against nature. So it's, it's, it's a unique thing is what we, we are behaving by nature. But if we, if we don't snap out of it, we, we're going to go extinct. So, so we're, what I mean yes. is we have to do an incredible feat of self-knowledge on a mass scale. So what, what happens now is in, in the dialogue is, as you know, when you talk about depopulation, then immediately the mammalian brain goes, oh, that's my department. Babies are going to die. Freak out. So he's saying like, okay, now the mammalian brain has to be quietened down. In this case, alien cortex needs to rule and say, six billion people dying is better than complete extinction. So the alien cortex needs to overrule the mammalian brain that's going apeshit hysterical. Six billion deaths, horrendous deaths, hysterical. It's like, yeah. whoa, this is a lot to ask of a chimp. I, I, I then get that. You can't I stay in the that. alien cortex. Then to, then, then, then to survive, you need mutualism. Then you have to step in and be a mutualist, which is from our primate brain. And it's like, but, you know, our primate brain steps in when, you know, people are thinking in terms of, well, that person is a scientist. That person is a Nobel Prize laureate. So we should be listening to them. No, they're psychopaths. And your, your, your primate brain is telling you to listen to a fucking psychopath. You should be overriding your primate brain. Your primate brain should come in after we've killed all the fucking bastard psychopaths when we've eliminated them straight from our reptilian brain slaughter the buggers then you need the primate brain to step in and be a mutualist and then be nice to everybody that's left but it's kind well, of like yeah. you know escape the room we have to do, well, you have to apply this and this and this in the right order if you don't get that order right extinction what it's is the chance so, that this chimp can so govern himself so well that he can apply these parts of his brain to escape the room? Very fucking low. We, we're looking so at it. a fucking it's, miracle. It's, it's, of not like, it's not like where the climbers were hanging from the cliff and uh, the two people that are hanging on are the are the are the are the in group and the the people that are uh, dangling hands free are all the psychopaths and we can just cut it like that. Like some of the people that are that are dangling are us like we're the ones that are going to die too um and uh like i i think that we are we need to realize like um you know kind of make peace with that in a way that that um you know i i feel like i i've i've got um you know i'm gonna try not to but you know if if anyone deserves to die, it should be me. Like <laughs> there's so, so many things that I contributed okay. negatively to the world, right? So, so, so damn you, Ryan! I, I when I when I did that analogy, I saw we were going to go here. <laughs> like, okay, so let's 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 work this analogy and and and, and what and what you saying? Because okay, let's start off with like. In this analogy of the climate, is who are the guys that are hang, clinging to, 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 to the rock base and who's hanging? Now, the vast majority, the, the scientists and the economists and all the talking heads and the activists and all these social justice warriors, they think that they're the ones holding on the cliff and all the brown people are hanging. So it's it's very, very racist to start saying, talking about Thanos, because what you're talking about genocide is about brown people. No. The people that are actually attached to the cliff are the Sami. They are the San people. They are the Piraha people. 
These are the guys that are attached to the cliff. These are the guys that have a fucking prayer. These guys are still attached to the mountain. The guys hanging off the cliff are guys in urban areas. They all of us. So you're right. We are hanging. So where do we stand on this? Exactly as you said. We, we as the enlightened Western urbanites, are in the worst position. We are hanging and the cut point is above us. Where we have to... <laughs> it's terrible, man. Where we have to be as, as, <laughs> as enlightened people is we have to cut the rope above us. And who falls is us and all the other stupid dumb fucks that don't know they're hanging. They are the urbanites. They are the person that lies on the grid. Have a look out of your window. Ask yourself how far away you are from your necessities. How many steps in the chain of your basic necessities are there? If you count more than one, you're on the dangly bit. If the things that are keeping you alive, I mean, look, look in next to you. If you're lying in an ICU and then you can see an oxygen pump there, is okay. You need that fucking machine to stay alive. What does that machine need? <laughs> it needs electricity. It needs oxygen. Where does that oxygen come from? It's bottled in fucking India. So it needs the shipping lanes to be open. It needs there not to be a war. It needs the cyber terrorists, which are coming in droves, are not fucking bringing down the infrastructure. It means that the guys on the ships are being fed means that you have a nursing staff. It means you have a hospital. It means that you have a financial system that's paying you medical aid to keep your bills going in the hospital. You, my China, are done. <laughs> There's no way that the machine, the oxygen machine is going to be getting oxygen from India. This is going to be doing all of this fuck. And, and, the, and Kaiser Permanente is still going to have a listing on the stock exchange. <laughs> After the grid goes down, you're gone. So, so I think I think it, of that through, man. Just ask yourself where you are on this thing. So yeah. what you should be thinking of in terms of like, am I doomed? Say, yeah, you probably are. So it's like, do the decent thing. Cut the rope. It's above your head around here. Right. So Sorry, uh, dude. now <laughs> after, after we run. get past this phase, um, of you know the the macabre phase of realizing that that we need to be the the human shield um is it is there uh it, you know, during you know all of this this catastrophe situation you're going to get a lot of uh people climbing up the rope you're going to get a lot of people encroaching on the piraha territory on the sand people territory that they're going to be running away refugee style um, from the cities and just destroy the last few people that would have made it. So the, that, the I, that's why I we think, have to cut the rope quick. Yeah. Well, either we cut the rope quick, you see that, the... or we protect those people that, that deserve to live. Uh, so it's hard to protect them. You see, like the Piraha already, you look at the Machaganga, all, all of those <clears throat> those tribes, they are already getting guys coming in that are the first refugees, in other words, from the city. So they're basically guys hunting, they're renegades, they're drug dealers. They, they are the first pirates that are this kind of sea peoples. So, uh, you know, like the Bra Brazilian government is, is protecting the Piraha. They're protecting them from like corruption of the mind, like from missionaries <laughs> who want to go there and like bag the the last of the Mohicans before we go down. But, so the Brazilian government is protecting them. But uh, when, the, if you imagine the Brazilian government as a crisis, fiscal crisis, they for the for the Piraha, and we can't do anything either because the. There are a lot of guys who, who are very capable and have guns. And, um, you know, they can go survivalist. And uh, the, the Piran in desperate, desperate trouble. It's, it's the same with the Samians, <laughs> the guys up north and 
the sun people and, and stuff is is very very likely to to take those those guys out as our last gasp so, so the, the the one the, the viable the viable survivors from our species are, are very liable to be taken down but the, the the way to give them the best chance is is to take the system down decisively and and rapidly so in other words the 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 guys that are best situated are close to the sea you want you want to make sure primarily that this the sea survives it's, it's not the land is not so important but you want to make sure that the the fish are there and stuff and that they can rebound they will rebound quick in like two or three years but you see the 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 land's going to warm up seven degrees in the interior minimum so it's it's not really viable but the the sea is still viable life can still go back to the sea and people can still survive in some shoreline areas you're not going to survive in the middle of siberia in the middle of australia and stuff it's like it's you know, wet bulb temperatures are going to get you but um and or, or just just starvation and, and stuff like that but so the the what we're doing is we're just taking out the last props we're like hunting the last white rhino that they they need for the their survival um and so but if you if you can get to the system take it down and keep it down but it needs very few people to do it right they just just have to be determined and and know what they're doing so th this there's this very very dangerous psychology i must talk about this i always keep on saying that this is our biggest danger is that the alien cortex will take us all out out of spy when it goes down this that is the biggest challenge we have we have to face so so um the uh, it's like think of it this way just the other day i was amazed uh, a friend of mine who I'm stunned. Can't believe that he said this. Uh, but he said that basically that we, we had a kind of a Duma conversation. He's a kind of famous Duma. And he said, you know, like, isn't it the case that humans have caused so much damage that it's better that we just roll back? It's better that we go extinct. We've caused so much damage to this this planet it it needs to go on uh the animals give them a chance and it's like whoa that's that's it that's the fucking thing i'm trying to warn people against that sentiment is horrendous what i said to him was i, I said like first of all we who's this we <laughs> i didn't say that but that's what i was thinking saying like you saying we did such a no we did not the piraha people did not fuck up this planet irredeemably. Neither did the Sami, neither did the Bacha Gang, neither, neither did the Sam people, neither did the Aborigines, neither did the guys in Papua New Guinea. Those guys did fuck all. Why do they need to die? The people that did all this was us. The fucking guys who are now saying like, oh, well, humans are so destructive, it's better that we all go extinct. No, it's better you fucking go extinct. Why? Because you're white. You're the problem. You're the Cro-Magnum fucking Neanderthal crossbred that caused this fucking industrial nightmare. You the fucking problem. You failed hybridization. You're a freak. Me, you, white people, and a bit Asian too. They're not out of the woods. They've also got Neanderthal. So there's basically we are failed hybridization. We the guilty party. We the guys. Yes, we must go extinct. You got that right. But why everybody? Why the poor? Are they viable? We are not viable. So it's like you got it half right. But you see the problem. See, you see that. You see that sentiment. That is almost line for line out of the manifesto of the Columbine shooters. If you read what those guys said, they said said nothing matters anymore. Said we've ruined the planet. Humans don't deserve to live. We we should give the planet back to the animals. That's is my almost verbatim for what I can remember for the Columbine shooters. So so the Columbine shooters are exemplifying the behavior that I'm saying is going to be done on a mass scale. I'm talking Xi Jinping. I'm talking 
psychopaths like Putin and Biden, that level. Those guys are going to do a Columbine. See, that, that's the danger. You got to take those fucks out. So, the, so here, you see what I mean is, is that in that, you get to that Columbine shooter situation on a global scale. And that's what we, we our biggest, biggest hurdle, right, is, is that. So, I hope I got that across because I've said it in a lot of ways. I always get the, the feeling that people don't believe me, <laughs> they don't see it. It's, it's the, this is all a battle of the alien cortex. The alien cortex is self-loathing. By the own logic and reasoning of the alien cortex, you can see that it's going to take itself out. So it's all about transformation, but it's going to take it out. All of us, literally, even, even guys that are not dominated by the alien cortex, like the Pirahar, those guys are viable, innocent. They, they don't have this overactive alien cortex. So it's like, why do they have to die? It's like, it's like if, if the chimps get to survive and the bonobos, let the fucking Piraha, they fucking, you know, they viable. Fuck it, man. It's like, we're not viable. So it's, you got a choice. It's like, if you're white, if you're an Aryan, if you're Jewish, <laughs> you got a choice. You can either do a rapid transformation, metamorphosis of your own psyche, your own alien cortex, has to wipe it out by rewiring itself. Okay, that either that or top yourself. Otherwise, we're looking at a Venus scenario, man. It's like, so after Pocahontas goes over the rapids, it's, these guys are talking out of their ass when they're talking about, you know, climate sensitivity and the next equilibrium point. All we know is we're going through a chaotic region and out of stability, out of the stability of the Holocene, where it restabilizes, don't believe anybody. We have no data. All these guys are talking shit. All their models are crap because their models are based on prior history. We don't have any model for, as far as I know, there's no model for what emerges after such a rapid rise in CO2. It's just too complex to work out. All you know, and when it basically restabilizes around some kind of you know, equilibrium attractor on the other side of the rapids, we don't know where that is. There might be Venus, it could be 18 degrees. It's not necessarily, they will say, oh, it stabilizes at four to five degrees. Horseshit. Where do you get that stuff out of? Out of your ass. It's based on computer models that were generated from back data in the Holocene when things were stable. You, you, so, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, there's a lot at stake here. <laughs> it's everything. This is the end game, like <laughs> Derek Jensen says. Yeah, this is me try, but I, I always think about this when we used to talk about the alien text one. To, if, if you don't, if, if I don't live, then nobody else gets to, uh, is uh, at the uh, end of the movie, um, the, there's a, I mean, there's a spoiler in this, I guess, but that definitely happens at the with with the uh, the main villain of the movie. Um, is that he, he's says, oh, well, I'm dying, so everybody else now has to. Um, it, it, he's a he's a gangster, you know, billionaire type of guy. <laughs> so it, it, it's who I first think of every time. So okay, so. Hopefully, we deep enough into this video that uh, we only have some real dedicated extinctionati. But I, I'm gonna give you a bit of secret knowledge now. <laughs> this is not for everybody to hear. So, this is the secret to survival. Goodbye. Sorry, I have to. Okay. Oh, you left at the wrong point. <laughs> <laughs> I was just talking to Mike about how uh, the alien cortex will pr protect itself by saying, like, i got to leave. <laughs> that, the cop will come in. I, I suspect that's what happened. <laughs> so, anyway, okay. So this is for secrets for survivors. Okay, the way to survive is 
You cheat. <laughs> it's the only way. It's come by so, Okay, so let's go back. Yeah, you see, you see, you see, the, the, the survivors out of this is, okay, so take, take the rope analogy. Is you, you have to pretend that you're cutting the rope above you, but you cut it below you. Okay, well, what, what I mean by that? <laughs> what I mean by that is, okay, if you have a look at these grand alien cortexes showdowns, like, okay, I'll give you a good one, Masada. <laughs> you say, like, okay. It's well worth looking at Masada very, very closely because it's a kind of Masada situation. Is like the Romans are building a ramp and they're going to get you. And, you know, you, you, if you're male, you're going to be castrated and taken into slavery. And if you're female, you're going to be raped and taken into slavery. And it's way better to die. How do you survive this situation? Well, the first thing is you can, first thing is you have to admit you can't. So you have to admit that you're in a situation where you're better off offering yourself like they did in Masada. So great. We all offer ourselves. The key to survival is telling everybody we all offer ourselves and I'll do the thing. I make sure I draw the last straw and I wield the last sword. Because it, <laughs> I hope you're getting this. If everybody tops themselves and you're the last one to wield the sword, you get to go and hide in the well. <laughs> Romans come and go, oh my God, they all top themselves. They're not going to look in the well. <laughs> That's how you get to survive Masada. In fact, <laughs> studying Masada pretty well, I think that is what happened. That's how we know what happened at Masada. People survived it. Yeah, you know, you've got to ask yourself, how? They cheated. <laughs> they they all went into the this like can't say the word because uh, it's a trigger word. But they went into the unalive yourself pact and they cheated. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanna get to that here because now there's I've not a lot of room for, for everybody to know that, right? It, the whole plan falls down if <laughs> everybody knows that. Oh, I'm starting to realize that as I get into this, uh, you know, looking into Desiderata, that those who survive, uh, and we talked about this before, the rats, like they don't have, uh, I mean, I guess we were born in society, uh, civilization, we're always taught binary, you gotta be either you're a good person or you're a bad person. Bad people go to jail. Good people are elevated and they're promoted. And there's never a gray area. But those who who work in the sh like the gray areas seem to be best suited, adaptable. So, yeah, that's interesting. The, the, the good people are the guys who who have buried the skeletons deep. <laughs> so here's the here's the first the first thing is like guys get over this high-flown moralism it's like we're fucking chimps man. <laughs> we all got fucking skeletons in the closet it, the difference between the white hats and the black hats are the white hats have buried their skeletons deeper and more skillfully that's all <laughs> sorry to <laughs> tell you this <laughs> but that's yeah and the that's and the, the positions where uh, no one would dare but th uh, think that there's anything bad about them. That's where the the darkest of the black heads like to <laughs> to, to uh, gravitate towards, like the priesthoods and the the politicians and the the you know um, Mother Teresa type of situation. Yeah. Yeah. So so okay. So I'll give you a little test here. Okay. So we're we're in the Harry Potter movie, and. You're Valdemort, the most evil, evil creature known to man. And, you know, you want to survive to the final episode of Harry Potter. How do you do it? You just be Harry Potter, not Valdemort. <laughs> Valdemort is scripted to die. Harry Potter is Valdemort. He's the evil one. <laughs> How do you know? He got through. 
<laughs> it's only the evil one. That's true. <laughs> you gotta be a little bit evil, guys. Sorry. To this, to that. Mm -mm. You're not gonna make it. So <laughs> you you wanna be ninety-nine percent good. <laughs> It's that one percent of evil that's going to save your ass. So this this is all kind of passed down in code. There's a in ancient Egypt they they you can have a mural. There's a mural of the judging of the pharaoh, and you can see all the key characters and <laughs> all of them. They're all parts of our psychology, and you can see the advocate. But it's the advocate for the hero. No, you know the hero, the the pharaoh. He represents us. Orion, if you like, Mithras, the hunter, the Hercules, the hero. Uh, so, so it's all a, it's called the weighing of the heart. Right? So, the ancient Egyptians didn't think that our intelligence was in our brain. That's a Western thing. They thought our intelligence was in our heart because they, I guess, they had more of a conscience. They can feel the paraclete. They can they can feel they're more in touch with their heart, their heart right so they can feel their heart directing them less than their head is my suspicion but anyway the net result is you see it in the mural it's the pharaoh's heart that's being weighed against a feather and so how it's presented to you if you go to Egypt the guide will tell you is the pure the pharaoh has to be impeccably good the pure the pharaoh has to have utterly pure. So the heart, the brain, in other words. So the, the alien cortex, Pharaoh's alien cortex, has to be perfectly erased. He has to be alien cortex free. You know, the meek inherit the world, the earth, all this kind of thing. So like, no, not quite. The heart is weighed not against an empty scale. The heart is weighed against a feather. <laughs> so in the feather is your survival. Does that make sense? It's like the line. The pharaoh does not have a perfect heart. The pharaoh has a, at least the corruption a weight of a feather. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's, quite you, it's a trap to go through with the thing. It's kind of where Christ, Christ, Christ Christ missed, right? Christ was a miss. He, he got put up on the cross. Why? He thought you had to be perfect. Yeah. Um, the the yeah. original definition of sin is is a miss, missing the mark, right? So he just called Christ a sinner. Christ a sinner. He, he, he missed the mark. He's, he's there up on the yoke. The yoke's on him. The, that cross is a yoke. It's, it's, it's not a... The crucifix is a, a yoke for oxen. <laughs> so, so, okay, since we went here, let's lose all our Christian audience at a stroke. Is it, so, so Christ uh, what, was almost certainly not nailed up on a cross. I, I think that Jesus existed and he, it says, if you're the very first account, is in the letter of Paul's letters, epistles. And he says unequivocally twice what happened to Jesus. He was hung from a tree. <laughs> so, so like, now that's the, you see, they, they put the epistles after the synoptic gospels. So we read it not in the, in the chronological order of the, of the myth rather than the order it was written, but the most accurate account is Paul's. So I say, why have we got him up on, Roman standard execution technique of a crucifix. And it's, it's obvious because this the Christian myth comes from Jews in exile in Greece. The first Gospels, I was told in school, they were written in Aramaic because that's the, la the, the language that all the disciples spoke. So they must have been in Aramaic. And uh, they will. It's like, no. The very first copies of the Gospels were Greek. They were done by Jews in exile. So it's like, why did they cover up the fact he was he was uh, hung from a tree? So because any Jew in exile 
the minute you start trying to sell the story of Jesus to them, they're going to ask how he died. And then you know, you, you, you're going to have to say, uh, well, he was stoned and hung from a tree. And then they know instantly, well, he was condemned by, by the elders. He was condemned by the Jewish elders. Why? For blasphemy. That was the that was the standard punishment for blasphemy. And it's basically you hung, you stoned, and then hung from a tree. So as soon as you said, "Oh, you know, Christ is the true Messiah," they're like, "Dudes, the elders condemned him. So don't tell me about this fucking criminal." <laughs> they never get anywhere propagating the Christian myth if they told the truth. So they they had to hide the fact that he was executed by the elders, the Jewish elders, for the crime of blasphemy. And his blasphemy was to say he was the Messiah. Were the elders correct? Yes. Yes. We're chimps. We're not messiahs. So he was justly killed by the alien cortex in the form of, the, of those Jewish elders. And it's like, it's, how do we know this? Is because scholars know there's there's no as according to the accounts in the synoptic gospels, is Jesus was very careful not to break any Roman laws. He didn't break a Roman law. Saying I'm the king of the Jews isn't there's no law that says that's not insurrection. So he would have had if he had been really executed by the Romans, he would have broken the Roman law, and that law would have been put up above his cross. So the inscription on the cross would have said, you know, like Article 1053, Standard Law in Judea, insurrection. It would be mainly insurrection. And that's that's what it's a warning to other people. So if they put, you know, King of the Jews up there, it's like that's not a Roman law. They would never have the Romans would never have put a convict, executed a convict, and put some bullshit like King of the Jews and. Jesus didn't break any Roman laws. He was scrupulously careful not to. So scholars know very well what, what happened. They just tell all the sheep. It's a bullshit story. But what that that crucifix is is the yoke of Christ. And it, it, it is literally in many churches and stuff. It's it's a repurposed yoke for oxen. So it's basically they, they they're not being very blunt about it. The Christian religion is about yoking you as an ox. So what's an ox? This is a castrated cow, it's a castrated bull. So it's basically, it's the alien cortex castrated and harnessed to a yoke. That's what Christianity yeah. is. I, I was with you until yeah, that last uh, oxen thing. But I, I think the it's pretty well known that that was a, a common punishment, a Roman punishment. And I don't know if they were doing the oxen symbolism. No, 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 not the Romans. No, I'm just saying in, in the later symbolism of the church, you see, eventually the, they, they invent the symbolism of the crucifix. But you see, the, the Romans never executed them. It's impossible. There's, there's well, some, it, it just doesn't, it, I mean, Romans the whole fashion thing is all out of whack. The, Roman did that, the Romans did that kind of execution very often um, uh, en masse. It's the right? standard. Yeah. Yeah, it was the um, standard. Yeah, it may not have happened to Jesus, uh, the the person, but it happened on mass, right? So it wasn't uh, it, by usurping yeah. that that they they can tell a story. Yeah, but you see, they they're telling the story in exiles to to Jews that have been um, exiled by the 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 diaspora. So basically, the Romans have turfed them out of Judea for being too problematic, and and guys like. Uh, John of Patmos and stuff. He's in Greece, and basically they they're spinning yarns. I mean, Greece is full of myths, and Christ myth comes out of it. But they they have to substitute. They have to hide the fact that he was uh, executed by the Jewish elders for blasphemy, and then say, you know, it's a really saleable to to tell all these pissed off Jews in exile that say like, who killed Jesus? The Romans. Oh, then they all years. Well, you got some converts right away. <laughs> and, yeah. But then you have to say, you know, they're going to ask some details. And you have to say, well, how did they kill him? Well, it's got to be the standard Roman way. So it's got to be crucifixion. And then the whole story falls apart. Because you can clearly see that the guys who wrote all about it, they didn't understand the, the, base, the basic um, geography around Jerusalem. 
they got all the distances wrong and the places wrong and, the, and then the time sequence wrong and the sort of passion play doesn't hang together even slightly but uh, you can see them all like making it up <laughs> fabricating yeah. it Smith. Uh, i can i can see the bull symbolism and stuff um because of how intertwined the the myths of of jesus were with um the myth of Mithras, right? So the slaying of the bull and stuff like that. Uh, for those who don't know, the the Mithras was, uh, I mean, that religion was like a thousand years earlier than than Christianity, and Mithras was born um, on December twenty fifth under a supernova like star in a cave with three magi uh there and um you know there's a scorpion in the cave oh, from a virgin side. most important from a virgin yeah yeah um so yeah it's uh um and uh mithraism was very common um uh supported by the um the Roman legionaries and things like that. It was very popular. It was a rival religion to Christianity until about uh, the the four hundreds, um, uh, uh, the fourth century, maybe, maybe not the four hundreds. Um, and uh, when when Christianity became the official religion then uh, of Rome, then they kicked the the Mithraism out. But you know, as uh, the churches is uh often does it it um kind of bought some converts with some uh you know saying hey you can worship our our guy and it's just like your guy <laughs> so um and bringing bring brought some of those people into the fold that way yeah so 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 mithra so mithras and mithraism was not antithetical to christianity paul made it that way because he he struggled you see the mithraic guys say yeah yeah we're completely up with this jesus we understand who he is he's mithras and then paul went no he's not fucking mithras and they said yeah he is <laughs> they basically rattled off all the things. They, we know the story. Say, no, no, no. It's not that story. It's a new one. And so basically, he really struggled to differentiate himself from Mithras. And the guys were completely accepting. Myth Mithra Mithraism was completely accepting to, to Christianity. But uh, the the Constantine banished all of that. So, so uh but Mithraism ended before Constantine uh, because um, they brought Sibylle from Sibylle. So there's a close relationship between uh, Mithras and Sibylle. So Mithras wears the Phrygian cap, this, you know, the Smurf cap that that's, uh, runs all the way to the French Revolution. And hello, <laughs> uh, that Phrygian cap comes from Anatolia, from Turkey. So that that is the the cap of the Corybantes. The Corybantes are the galley, the, the castrated priests of Sibylle. So, so uh, it's closely related to Attis. So, so, um, so what Constantine, uh, the soldiers were really Sol Invictus. So, uh, um, Sol Invictus was the, the national cult of, of Rome uh, at the, the time when Constantine came up events against um, Machiavellius. No, what was his name? I can't remember. But anyway, they had a battle at the Milvian Bridge, and um, Constantine won uh, simply because they were contesting the, the throne of Caesar. And Constantine won by a clever trick. He realized that a lot of these guys were, the Roman soldiers were Christians. They had no reason to, to to fight and die for Constantine, and they really weren't going to do it. If they were, they were going to do it really half-heartedly. And so he had a brilliant idea, and he said, you know, okay, uh, we'll uh, just say he confabulated the story that he had this vision, that he saw the cross, which is like an X, in this case, over Sol Invictus, over the sun. And so he said, you know, he appealed... He, he turned what was just, you know, a factional fight between guys battling, you know, in the Game of Thrones and turned it into a religious war, which was very clever because then he won. <laughs> so, but he only won by appealing to religion. He would have lost if he didn't do that. He was slated to lose. 
And then after that, then he kind of a, had to stick with this dumbass Christian <laughs> cult thing. Yeah, he was cornered. And was uh, his mom, his mom went, went in for Christianity in a big way. I thought it was his wife that convinced him. It was how is it that the soldiers were all Christian? Well, no, his though? mother. He was close. It was close to his mother. But they they confabulated that afterwards. So it, it was, yeah, it's, 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 it was close to his mother, and she became big on Christianity. Okay, the soldiers. I don't think his wife. Yeah. At that point. The what? The soldiers were in that. The soldiers were majority Christian at that point. Uh, not majority Christian. The the official cult was Sol Invictus and uh, Sol Mithras, but the 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 they were increasing numbers of Christians, and Constantine knew it. So they, the Christians were tolerated, right? The the um, but uh, you know I I mean percentage wise it's like fifty fifty <laughs> percent maybe is my guess, but if. It was a growing thing, so it's 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 the up and coming meme in the Roman army, and and so uh, Constantine just made a cynical appeal to the to the smith, and um, because he knew it would be popular with the soldiers, and instantly turn it into a religious war, and give them something to fight for, and then that's the only reason why you've even heard of <laughs> Christianity. You would never have heard of it apart from that little incident of. Little sleight of hand, <laughs> but the that you see, if you go back to Mithras, that's where the iconography of the bull comes from, and the Taurus in the night sky, and it's that goes back very far because you can see that same bull appear over and over again. You can see it at Chat Chatelhoya, you can see it at Gobekli Tepe. You can you, that that's the theme and the obvious interpretation is that's our head that's our brain that's our alien cortex you can see the hero facing off against it which was kind of the plot <laughs> um is there any connection with uh in spain uh with the moors and the and and running of the bulls and the, the bullfighting stuff um that tradition with Mithraism? No one, no one knows. But I strongly suspect that a lot of other people have looked at bull baiting, and if you if you look at what they're doing, especially the picadors, you know, the clowns and stuff, and uh, teasing the bull, I think, and a lot of other people think that it comes to Spain through Crete, because the Minoans, you can see. In Creek, you can see them doing exactly a bullfight that looks like a Spanish bullfight with the guys doing, you know, picador and the, the, they're teasing the bull. They're doing those clown tricks like rolling over the bull's head. Now, when you go to, uh, now it's amazing because that that's, uh, you know, 1174 and stuff. It all comes down with the sea people. That's the end of Crete and the Menonites. But the, the amazing thing is, that if you go to Chapel Hoyek, and so that's like 7,000 BC, then or 6,000 BC, uh, then there's a bull baiting scene that looks just like the Minoan one. So it's it's too much coincidence that the guys in Chapel Hoyek have uh, a bull baiting ceremony where they're teasing the bull. That that happens, you know, in Crete, and then it happens in in Spain. So the the Spanish one goes. All the way back into prehistory, people don't really know where bullfighting in Spain started, but it's it's got strong hints. You know, there are Torobolums and stuff, and Mithraeans and stuff all over. Um, anywhere the, where the Romans were, England and stuff like that. So um, hundreds of them, hundreds of them. So the you know it's it's clearly comes down the line. There's clearly a myth associated with that bull. It's, it goes very deep into deep time. Yeah, it was originally Persian, though, right? So um, that makes sense that it's it would be in Hoya. I think. Well, yeah, yeah. That makes uh, you know, so it's Ch 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 in Turkey. So, so it's yeah. it's, it's Aryan. I'm, I'm certain of it. It's uh, I'm certain it's it's an Aryan trope. 
Yeah, but Turkey was Persian. So I, I'm convinced it was. Ah, uh, well, Indo-Iranian. So the, mm -hmm. these guys are Aryans. It's better to call them Aryans. They don't like calling them Aryans because Hitler. <laughs> Yeah. So they jump through hoops and call them Proto-Indo-Europeans. And when they're in, in Persia, then they call them Indo-Iranians. And when, when they in Indus Valley, then they reluctantly call them Aryans because they kind of call themselves that. I mean, in the Bhagavad Gita, they call themselves Aryans. But then they don't like calling the Hittites Aryans, like clearly they are. The Phoenicians are clearly, clearly a branch of this. And the Yanmaya people would go west. They definitely, definitely don't like calling them Aryans. Why? Because of Hitler. <laughs> but they they certainly called themselves Aryans. That R sound is is uh, Aryan means of noble birth. It's supposed to mean that's what linguists think it means. But I don't think it does. It's that that R sound is noble because it means something to do with the sun. They're solo worshippers, and that R sound is something to do with the sun. So it's it, it, it's Ra, it becomes Ara in Egypt, but it's it's the same thread, and that that this, this that that Ra Aryan Armenian anything you hear with that R sound in that area is the same thing, and so why it's a noble birth is the same for like the Japanese emperors because it's supposed to have descended from the sun, and that that's got to be an Aryan thing. They they patriarchal, and they, the the myth is that it's um, yeah. that the patriarch. Is, is descended from the sun. Isn't that what the um, the word uh, theos, uh, like the, that that word goes back deus, um, the uh, deva, that, that's like, like sky father originally? Um, yeah, it, it is Zeus. The, 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 word, the word is actually Zeus. And uh, Zeus means uh, deus. It, it, I, yes. I'm not sure about Sky Father is is too strong, but but they, you know, uh, yeah, it, it it basically is a patriarchal god. You know. Not not sure if Sky is in the Zeus, but anyway, Zeus was a Sky God for sure. Yeah, I thought that was the Proto-Indo-European root was Sky Father. There there are a few other things that I. I think we can linguistically pull out. One is they had, um, I think they had the concept of the wheel um, in the in They invented language. the wheel, yeah. yeah. Um, and they had also the concept of mead. So they they knew how to domesticate honey and, and take control of that and use it for alcohol. Um, they had the word for, um, yeah, this sky father meme, I guess, kind of originates there and it's interesting to look at that and compare it to some some things that that are that are culturally you know divergent such as um the andoran uh religions and stuff ancient religions because those were like the gods come out of the earth the underworld and there's no sky father situation and linguistically they're also completely separate so there's there's just like this little isolated island of non-Indo-European um, thing, and interesting that the beliefs are also bifurcated there. Yeah, so the the Aryans are best known, and they probably in their own time would have been known for being charioteers. So they they domesticated the horse and invented the wheel. So you can. If you follow the chariot, you're following the AR1B gene, which was their signature gene. So if you go, you can see it in it go, the chariot goes to uh, India and becomes part of the Mahabharata and that tradition, and the Gita and, and Arjuna is a charioteer. And uh, you go south of Hittites and that they wind up in Egypt in the same freaking chariot. And then uh, the the Yanmaya people, some of the, those guys going that way, they're charioteers. So they they come with the horse and chariot. So you can follow the wheel, the horse and the chariot, all the way through to the industrial revolution. That the you today is the carriage of the Aryans. And if you're white, you're an Aryan. 
<laughs> the same freaking concept. You haven't come a long way since then. But what I, what I believe, they always put, if you look at where they put the origins of these people, they always put it on a modern map. And then they put it somewhere in the steppes above the Black Sea, around the Caucasus, the Atlas Mountains. By the way, Atlas and stuff is also associated with the bull. So the, the, uh, this is the Taurus Mountains, by the way, <laughs> if you, in case you're struggling for clues here. So the, um, the, the, those guys are wrong to put it on this modern map because right where they say, you know, they obviously originated for is now the Black Sea. So they always do the modern Black Sea, forgetting that the time of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, the Black Sea definitely, definitely wasn't there. So, so it's, it's clear that, to me at least, that, that what these guys are doing is they're living in this kind of Eden. That's where Eden is placed in the Bible, in, uh, right then near Gebekli Tepe, in fact. But it's, it's clearly Eden, Eden must be the kind of Okavango swamps, <coughs> the thing the Danube, all these freshwater things are, are draining into this marshland. They're clearly marsh people. A lot of flat areas for horses and chariots, but there the are a number of <coughs> different tribes and flavors of, of Aryan. And uh, they, they're Neanderthal cro magnum hybrid. They must be. And then the, re the best explanation <coughs> for why they get displaced is because the Dardanelles overflows and the Black Sea comes into existence. <coughs> and um, it all fits with the timeline, and then you can see the flood myth from Noah's flood myth and this you know, flood myth of Deucalion. It's the same story, word for freaking word. And um, yeah, that's the story all fits together, but nobody will say it the way I'm saying it because it's so politically charged. It's from, from stem to stern, what I just said would just make an academic's head explode because it's you know there's, there's there's so many taboos about history and the the, the nazi view <laughs> and who the norse people are and who they're young man they fight and fight and fight and what they're all trying to say is they're trying to hide the tracks of the alien cortex of this this cro magnum neanderthal failed crossbreed there's something wrong with that crossbreed and it tracks that ar1 <laughs> You, you mentioned the the Hittites having the that um, the chariot and stuff. Um, what about the Assyrians? Um, are they are they also the, the Assyrians are also Semitic? Okay. No, they they Semitic. So 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 after Noah, Noah has three sons according to the Bible. So Noah. Uh, you know, fetches up on Mount Ararat, which is in the Caucasus Mountains. So we're all talking Caucasians here. But the the uh, according to the Bible, then Noah has three sons: it's Shem, and that all the Semites come from Shem. And then uh, there's uh, Shem, who was Ham the other guy? And then Moab, I think. Yeah, Ham and Moab. And so <clears throat> Ham is all the black people. Um, uh, and then Moam is all the rest, I think. Uh, but anyway, the, those Semites are Sumerians, um, Assyrians, Hittites. So the Jews are really Hittites. They get mysterious about, oh, they emerged suddenly out of the blue in Egypt. And it's like, nah, they conquered Egypt. The Hittites. <laughs> Yeah, they did. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's very interesting. I think. Um, can you explain why white people are called Caucasian? Because because they come from the Caucasus Cauc Caucasus Mountains. So so Do they? Uh, so when the Black Sea filled <laughs> up, up it, when when the Black Sea filled up, it. Um, you know, its its furthest extent uh, was the Caucasus Mountains and Mount Ararat. <laughs> so there are a couple of Mount Ararats, but the, the genuine one is in the Caucasus Mountains, and that must be the one they're talking about in the Bible. So, so that, Noah must have been some, some guy, some patriarch. 
there's another one in Turkey, but that can't be the right one. It, right. it must must be the one in Azerbaijan where they, the, you know, because because they call they Caucasians they they it's called Mount Ararat. Is again that's our son, our Ararat. You, you know the the Aryans. <laughs> Whenever you hear that R, it's a giveaway. So, uh, yeah. So they must Aryans must have named Ararat. And and I think that. So I think that's the the name for the sun. I mean, it's got something to do with the the sun and sun rising and stuff. Because uh, you know, by the time it becomes Ra in Egypt, I, I think it was originally called Ara. So it's like just like Ararat. So it's like Ararat is like Ara's mountain, the sun's mountain, or sunrise mountain, or something like that. <laughs> And we go all the way from there to the Industrial Revolution. And so the, these people, if you, you trace their history, these people have destroyed the earth. They're us. Particularly me. I'm guilty as fuck in this regard. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Start on destroying this. Very fascinating. <laughs> I'd catch up given enough time, but I think you got a head start. Yeah, well, it's 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 speculation, but you can. It's very easy to put together a story that works better than <laughs> the mainstream story. Uh, besides, you know, they they so hell bent on twisting uh, history. <laughs> history is is war. It's weaponized. Anyway, we better stop at that crucial point, which will probably get us banned from YouTube after this. So, okay, just uh, pause, let go, and come to point of stillness. Om Paramahamma. So anyway, but that that Atman too is is a Sanskrit word. Uh, that's that's Aryan, so, and so so Atman too is from from that same root from R. <laughs> so Atman, Aryan concept. Sorry. Okay. Well, that's it. Thank you. That was good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. All right. I guess.